welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first Return to Learn Faculty Town Hall. I'm Senior Associate Vice Chancellor Bob Continetti and I'll be your moderator today. For today's Town Hall, we have a group of panelists who are here to answer questions about the Return to Learn program that we're instituting here at UC San Diego. We will attempt to answer these questions and please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A as well. But due to our time limitations, we will not be able to get to all the questions today. We'll log the questions as they come in and post them on a, on a FAQ on the Return to Learn website, returntolearn.ucsd.edu. But first, I would like to welcome our Chancellor Pradeep Kosla for uh, some opening remarks. Chancellor Kosla. Thank you, Bob. Uh, welcome everybody and good afternoon. Uh, what are you gonna hear about today and what you've heard from me uh, through multiple memos to the campus is a couple of months of very hard work uh, by multiple committees, task forces, work groups, uh, all of which were populated by faculty, students, and staff, uh, addressing issues of academic continuity, addressing issues of business continuity, addressing issues of education, uh, research, uh, staff working, and, and I can go on and on. All of these people worked extremely hard, so let me first start by saying thank you to each and every one of these members and the leadership. Uh, and also acknowledge that their hard work was uh, informed by a whole lot of evidence, by a whole lot of science, uh, by a whole lot of expertise from our faculty, while at the same time they worked within a lot of, with a lot of uncertain information, a landscape that was changing weekly, if not daily, and sometimes both. Uh, so nonetheless, where we are right now is based on our best understanding, our best judgment, uh, of multiple constituencies of UC San Diego as to how we should be incrementally repopulating our campus. Uh, having said that, I can tell you and assure you that our first and foremost priority has been health and safety of our, of our communities. Uh, and we are willing and capable of switching our strategy if and when the need or the circumstances uh, demand. So with that said, let me hand this over back to Bob because these are the people you want to hear from and not me necessarily. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Chancellor Kozla. Now I'd like to welcome the host of this, this town hall today, Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Elizabeth Simmons. Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Bob. And thank you, Chancellor Kozla, for your introductory remarks. Um, thanks to all the panelists for being here today as well. Well, welcome everybody to our first Return to Learn Town Hall session. This session is geared primarily toward faculty and we will be having further town halls uh, to address the questions of other sectors of our campus community over the coming weeks. We hope that this town hall will be a chance to address many of the questions that you may have about our current remote learning environment and the developing plans for the incremental return to campus in the fall. Now, as you're aware, there are uh, constantly changing uh, local, national, and international developments related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our plans for UC San Diego in the coming weeks and months continue to adapt in response to the latest turn in events. So let me be very clear, as you just heard Chancellor Kosla say, the health and safety of our campus community is paramount in all of our decision making. That has been true and that will continue to be true. We will keep adhering to the guidance from public health officials throughout. We really appreciate your flexibility, your patience, your understanding, and your collaboration as the situation continues to evolve over time. Now, as Senior ABC Continetti mentioned, we won't be able to answer every single question during our limited time today, so we do have several other ways to get information to you. Bob already mentioned that a frequently asked questions site will be created based on this event. We also have the Return to Learn website with uh, the latest information about fall plans and then the more specialized Keep Teaching, Keep Learning and Keep Working websites with web uh, updates and uh, resources for you. Also, the newsletter that my office distributes every couple of weeks has academic affairs announcements and additional resources. So the panelists have very valuable updates to share with us today, and we want to also get to as many of your questions as possible. So I'll turn this back over to senior AVC Continetti, and uh, we'll get going. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, ABC Simmons. 
To bring us up to date on the state of the pandemic, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and, Glo and Global Public Health, and his colleague, Dr. Natasha Martin, who is an Associate Professor also in the School of Medicine. Chip and Natasha. Thank, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, as EVC Simmons has said, this epidemic it continues to shift around us, and the epidemiology both internationally and locally uh, attests to this. This shows you how the epidemic has over time shifted. Uh, this shows how the epidemic over time has shifted from um, being one that was uh, concentrated in China to Europe and now is the US is dominating the epidemiology of this disease around the world. Next. Likewise, in the United States, you can see that the epidemic started uh, with both feet in the blue Northeast and over time has gradually uh, tapered off in the Northeast but we're now undergoing an explosion in the South and in the West across the Sun Belt, as you've been seeing. Next. In San Diego, uh, we've seen a steady accumulation of cases with an acceleration over the last several weeks, now uh, moving to as many as five to 600 new cases a day. As you can see on the far right side of the slide, the dominant age group uh, for our uh, epidemic is between the ages of 20 and 30, uh, with the second most frequent group, 20 to 40. In other words, uh, this epidemic in San Diego is being driven uh, by young people. Next. Uh, this is a result not of just increased testing, which you can see on the left is continuing to increase with over time, but more importantly and more concerningly over the course of the last several weeks, a marked increase in the percentage of people testing positive uh, at the testing stations around San Diego County. Uh, in short, we are in a, 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 a mini outbreak here uh, in San Diego County. Next. This led earlier this week to a change uh, in uh, the posture of the county toward uh, permitted conditions based on trigger points the state had set in place. Uh, as you heard, uh, these um, uh, things that changed included uh, looking at where the clusters of outbreaks have been occurring. They've been occurring in restaurants, bars, indoor events, including home events. This led to restrictions uh, on uh, indoor restaurants, bars, theaters, and museums but unfortunately did not include gymnasiums and mega churches. Uh, what we've been seeing is that there's very little evidence of, um, of um, transmission and standard business operations in which people are masking, distancing, and surface cleaning as we've been doing here on, uh, on our own campus. Uh, this is a very important issue. It's something we need to continue to do and something we may ultimately have to move uh, toward uh, more vigorous measures to make sure that these are um, adhered to by all of us uh, in our campus community. Let me turn now to uh, my colleague, Dr. Natasha Martin, who can tell you a bit about some of the uh, quantitative approaches that have been taken to, uh, to get us to the model we're in and some ideas about where things are going. Thanks, Chip. So in addition to monitoring the epidemiological um, scenario and situation in San Diego, we also are using modeling to forecast the epidemic. So this slide shows that the recent in, uh, likely increase in positive cases um, will continue to increase over the course of July, even if we were to um, go back to behavior as it was before Memorial Day, where we were seeing a very a relatively stable amount of um, transmission. Next slide. And this is echoed in forecasts looking at the top line is hospitalizations um, in blue and the bottom line is intensive care um, bed usage for COVID. And so we see um, recently there was a lag between positive cases, but now we're starting to see a sharp increase in hospitalizations as well as an associated increase in intensive care um, beds associated with COVID. And we would expect that to increase through the end of July and potentially at best only stabilize again if we were to um, go back and introduce more restrictions. So we're using this quantitative approach in forecasting modeling to try to understand um, our best approaches on campus. Next slide. So part of this quantitative modeling um, has helped inform our approach to return to learn and the return to learn program has three main pillars. The first is thinking about how we reduce the risk on campus through personal protection, sanitation, as well as structural configurations in terms of our housing and classroom sizes, for example. Along with that risk mitigation is a pillar of viral detection. That viral detection um, a pillar is aimed at detecting outbreaks as early as possible through both symptomatic and asymptomatic testing as well as environmental monitoring such as wastewater. 
Now, all of that needs to go hand in hand with public health intervention in terms of case isolation, contact tracing, and exposure notification. And these things, things will work together in order to enable us to detect outbreaks early and reduce the risk of further transmission. And our entire approach is adaptable. So we'll take the information as we go, monitoring the changing situation both in the San Diego region as well as on campus, and then adapt our approach on campus to best identify outbreaks and mitigate risk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. School and Dr. Martin. I've uh, never felt more fortunate to be at an institution with a great uh, school of medicine and health system than before. Next, we, uh, we're going to hear from the Vice Chancellor for, for Research Affairs, Sa Sandy Brown, who's going to give us an update about the research ramp up. Vice Chancellor Brown. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, delighted to be part of this initial re uh, return to learn uh, discussion with faculty today. Uh, I wanted to share with you where we are in on the research side of uh, the ramp up. We have over 750 research programs that have submitted plans to campus, uh, reviewed by their department chairs, reviewed by deans, uh, by EHNS when necessary, and our research office, and are actually already approved and uh, up and running on campus, in health sciences, and at SIO. It's very exciting. We have over 400 people on campus already, faculty, staff, and students, uh, who are testing out the components that you just heard about uh, from Natasha Martin. Uh, and every one of these people, uh, do their screening, uh, online screening every day, and follow basic safety guidelines that allow us to be in alignment with the county requirements and the CDC requirements for safety. So I want to thank you all, and uh, we're excited uh, to use research as a resource for the return to learn process. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. To brief us on the important topic of international students, we have Dulce Dorado, the Director of International Students and Programs Office in our area of global education. Dulce. Thank you, Bob. And I'm pleased to be here to be part of the Return to Learn uh, Faculty Town Hall. Um, today, I want to give a brief update on uh, Monday, July 6's um, update from the Student Exchange Visitor Program, which is part of the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, Department. In general, the uh, guidances that were issued in, includes information about fall 2020. Um, it's a temporary, it changed the temporary exemptions that were in place for spring and for summer 2020. Uh, two points to, to make. Number one, for universities that are holding primarily online courses, um, the international students will have two choices. Number one, either transfer to another university that offers in-person or hybrid courses, or they may have to depart the United States. For UC San Diego, because our intention is to offer a hybrid model, international students will be able to maintain their status and attend UCSD as long as they are enrolled in at least one uh, in-person or hybrid course during the fall 2020 term. Um, in the, on, on the slide on your screen here includes information about our office. Please refer to our frequently asked questions and also updated immigration updates. Um, our, our website is istudents.ucsd.edu. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Dulce. Next, we're going to hear from Himalata Javeri. She's the executive director of our housing, dining, and hospitality services, and she's going to be speaking about student move-in and on-campus housing. Thank you, Bob. In preparation for fall, we have eliminated all triple occupancy, which is over 2,000 beds. We have also have plans to have move-in be staggered over 10 days versus three days, which will allow students to come on campus, participate in daily symptom testing, and also take advantage of the SARS-CoV testing offered um, on campus as part of the move-in process and students will continue to receive their results in 20 day, uh, 24 hours, which is happening right now. If a student that is living on campus tests positive, we would move them to isolation housing, 
Um, it is not a new process for us. We have done this for the entire spring uh, quarter. And with the students uh, that are in isolation housing will receive support from student health and well-being services. And we will make sure that we drop off uh, uh, freshly hot prepared meals to the isolation units uh, three times a day. We're also able to meet all dietary restrictions. We also know that there is uh, restrictions uh, from CDC include, and the San Diego County Public Health in terms of travelers coming back from international locations. And in order to accommodate that, students that will be living on campus, we have identified 14 days of quarantine housing that students can take advantage of at no cost for housing and complete their 14 days of isolation before they move into their regular fall assignment. Thank you so much, Emlata. So today during registration, all attendees had an opportunity to, to submit questions for the panelists to answer. We've selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. Now, if you have a question now, please do submit it into the Q&A chat box and I can see questions are coming in there. As a reminder, we're not gonna be able to get to all these questions today, there's so many, but we're gonna do our best to answer them and we will be uh, also posting those answers in an FAQ page on the Return to Learn website after the webinar. Now I'd like to welcome all of our panelists to turn their cameras on and join us for uh, the question and answer period. So yeah, everybody's uh, coming back online. Uh, the first, uh, first question that I have is for uh, EVC Simmons. And the question is, is it possible that the university's current plans for fall on campus instruction could change between now and September or after classes begin. What will be the determining factors in such a decision? So the determining factors will all be based around health and safety and what the public health guidance is. So if the public health guidance is that we need to do nearly all of our teaching remote and uh, have very limited numbers of people on campus, then that's what we'll do. So we are in constant discussions um, uh, multiple times a week about the state of the pandemic and uh, what this means for our planning. And we will continue to adapt as necessary. I would mention that we have, um, the administration has a very close partnership with the Academic Senate on planning and on making sure that we support educational excellence regardless of the mode of instruction. Thank you. Thank you, EBC Simmons. The next question is going back to Dulce Dorado and concerns the recent SEVP ruling that non-immigrant F1 and M1 students attending schools operating entirely online remotely during fall 2020 may not take a full online course load and remain in the United States. Dulce, how is this going to impact UC San Diego students? What is the university doing to respond to this challenge? Um, so thank you for the question. So um, what the guidance said is uh, that students can remain in the United States in a hybrid model. So UC San Diego's model is hybrid. So students can maintain their status as long as they are enrolled in at least one course that's either in person or hybrid and is making normal progress towards their degree. How this will impact our students. So in particular, first the new students. Uh, new students can, uh, start their programs in the fall. They can start with their cohort, although remotely, and then join, their, join UC San Diego when they can, either in the winter or in the spring. Um, we will not activate their SEVIS records, but they can matriculate and start at UC San Diego. For those that are continuing students, um, again, as long as a student can enroll in at least one in-person or um, hybrid course, they will be able to maintain their status Currently, the, the chancellor and the EVC have charged a committee um, called the Fall International Education Collaborative, and we're working closely with faculty, uh, different areas of campus, and students are also represented on that collaborative. We're looking at various strategies to see what courses um, would be available, again, to ensure that our students are making uh, progress towards their degree. Um, I hope that answered the question from the faculty member. Thank you. Thank you, Dulce. The next question is about COVID-19 testing, and it's for Dr. Natasha Martin. Natasha, can you update us on the plans for COVID-19 testing for the fall? 
what methods will be used, how frequently, and how will we be addressing privacy concerns? Thanks. So testing for symptomatic individuals is always available. And in addition to that, we are implementing an asymptomatic testing program. The goal of the asymptomatic testing program is to de detect infectious outbreaks early enough for Cheryl Anderson's contact tracing team to manage them. So we did some modeling that helped us understand that if we wanted to detect an outbreak when there were fewer than 10 infections on campus, we would want to test 70% uh, of the campus population every month. So that general approach is designed to be adaptive. Um, based on data as it emerge, it may be more effective to try to sample some populations more or less frequently, depending on their own likelihood of becoming infected and, and their potential impact on campus based on the number or variety of people that they come into contact with. Um, so, so our testing approach may, may change as we collect more data. Um, in terms of what the testing will be, so at the moment, um, individuals will go to a nearby um, collection point where they can collect collect the samples and they'll actually be self-swabbing themselves. So individuals will take the sample, swab their own nose, or hopefully in the fall we will have validated a saliva test. Um, those tests will be processed in our UCSD lab and then individuals can get those results on their phones within 24 um, hours. Um, we are very um, considering obviously all the privacy issues that you asked about. So the samples will be collected with only a barcode and a birth date on them. Them. The results are reported back to an individual's medical records. Um, and so like any medical test, they'll be managed in a HIPAA compliant fashion. Well, thank you. Thank you, Natasha. So the next question for the panel, it goes to Vice Chancellor Matthews and Stephen Jackson, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Resource Management and Planning. Uh, can you describe the safety measures being taken in regard to cleaning protocols? personal protective equipment, and general campus operations? Thank you, Bob. I'd be happy to. Um, cleaning research and assessment of techniques have been ongoing since March. We've been testing new uh, approaches to sanitize the campus, as well as making sure that PPE is available throughout. Um, some of the things that we've done in terms of systems, we've flushed all of the building systems, pipes, plumbing, fountains, all of those have been sanitized and flushed. We've also in ensured that the buildings with closed systems have been running with 100% outside fresh air, and we will be going forward doing that throughout the, the, the year until advised not to. Um, we think it's a safe and prudent approach. Uh, we're also looking at buildings that have operable windows to, to best identify which windows that should be opened. Uh, part of what also has happened is we've worked very closely with our faculty on the campus, uh, Kim Prather, Dr. Sholey, to really look at, at next steps uh, while we monitor County Health and CDC and World Health. Uh, it's becoming clear that there are some concerns about aerosols and the transmission of the virus uh, th through the air. Uh, so our building systems have, again, as I mentioned, been cleaned. Uh, we've also increased the filter medium so that it's a higher level, uh, closer to a, a HEPA filter. And many of our building controls have been reset to, again, introduce as much fresh air as we possibly can. Uh, one of the things that we're stressing is that the buildings are clean. Part of what's going to have to happen as we move forward is that people are going to have to adhere to wearing a mask. Uh, and practicing social distancing to ensure that th the community also accepts those, those vital realities. I'm gonna turn the discussion over to my colleague, Steve Jackson, for some of the specifics. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Steve? And thank you very much, uh, Bob and uh, VC Matthews. The, the only, uh, well, and, and all of this information we'll be providing um, and, uh, as part of the frequently uh, asked questions with links to all of our specific services. I know time is, is limited, but the only thing I'd, I'd like to just highlight on the facilities management side and some of the things they're doing to uh, increase the enhanced cleaning. So in addition to the regular cleaning services, uh, facilities management has implemented the daily disinfecting of all uh, high touch point areas. And they're looking to stand up a sanitation team, you know, to increase that frequency to twice a day. 
there are they're continuing to use the uh, the restroom porter service for those high volume restrooms to maintain a higher frequency of cleaning in those areas. They've stood up a, a COVID in-house cleaning team to rapidly respond in those incident, instances where we've had individuals uh, show symptoms or come back with positive testing to, to get those areas cleaned and back in action as quickly as possible. And they're working to uh, in, install uh, several measures across the campus, including uh, hands-free access doors on all of the main building entrances, installing wall-mounted uh, hand sanitizers at all of those entrances, and also uh, incorporating foot pedals in all of the big belly units so that folks can throw trash and recycling away without having to touch the surfaces. And again, all of these measures are on our frequently asked page, and we'll, we'll get that out. Thanks, Bob. All right, thank you, Steve. Yeah, there's a lot of lot of work to do there, and those some of those uh, measures are very energy costly. I know that uh, that we talked about with the air handling. So now we would like to go back. A very important question in this trying period is uh, going to go to EBC Simmons, and the question is: What resources will the university provide to support students' mental health? So that's, I'm really glad that you asked that question. Um, the answer is a combination of two things. One is that during the winter and then accelerating into the spring, um, we began ramping up CAPS resources, um, uh, both in person and then, and then especially um, telemedicine for mental health uh, as well as uh, physical health services. And so um, that's already well in place and has been serving uh, the students throughout the pandemic so far. Our students passed a, uh, a uh, fee referendum this spring specifically designed to support hiring more CAPS mental health professionals. And so we are now in the process of uh, of uh, beginning to hire, I believe it is five additional mental health professionals for CAPS to continue serving students to the best of our ability. So that will significantly increase the um, hours available and the, um, uh, the uh, swiftness with which we can respond to student needs. So we're very well aware of this and we're really um, uh, as a campus responding. Thank you, EBC Simmons. So the next question is also pertaining to the student experience, and it's going to be directed to both uh, Dean of Undergraduate Education, John Moore, and Dean of Graduate Studies, Jim Anthony. And that is, how do we create and or sustain a sense of community on campus given these challenges of this period? Uh, I, can, I can start on the undergraduate side. So uh, we have student affairs staff, both in the undergraduate colleges and uh, Central Student Affairs staff, particularly student life. And both of those staffs have been very active in organizing virtual events for students. These can range from things like uh, film festivals to virtual dances, various virtual performances, um, dialogue circles, workshops. Many of these also provide students with opportunities to meet and discuss some of the challenges that they're facing in the remote, the remote environment. So these, these have been very successful and very well attended. In addition, um, there are student organizations, both centrally through Student Life and also in each of the colleges. And these organizations have been very active throughout spring quarter in meeting virtually and carrying on their, their special interest activities. And then finally, I, I would like to um, really have a shout out to our student government, our associated students, and I'm sure um, De Dean Anthony will talk about the GSA, but throughout the spring quarter, our associated students have been extremely active in engaging their constituents and bringing to the attention of the administration any of the concerns that students have. And so we, we work very, very closely with our representatives from associated students, also the Black Student Union, and um, this really, uh, allowed us to work through some of the, the more challenging aspects of spring quarter and, and the challenges. And I, I, and I, in each of the colleges, it also has its own student government who have also been very active in all of this. So I expect that these will continue in, into the fall. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, I want to echo everything that John said, particularly the connection between um, the Graduate Division and the Graduate uh, Student Association. <clears throat> We've done joint programming. They've done their own programming. We've done our own programming over the spring and now into the summer. 
um, online support groups, a whole variety of different ways to keep students engaged. And I know that all of you and within your departments have done amazing things. Uh, I would say one thing that's been incredibly humbling is to get emails from our graduate and professional students remarking upon the ways in which faculty themselves, just uh, we have been connecting with our own students, our own mentees. Um, this is gonna continue to be really, really important as we go into the year, regardless of what happens with the year, uh, continuing to check in one-on-one -on -one with our uh, masters and doctoral students and uh, you know maintaining that sort of connectivity. So uh, the graduate division will continue to increase its professional development portfolio over the course of the coming year uh, and to provide supports locally at the departments. Thank you. Thank you both. The next question is for Dr. Dr. Schooley or Dr. Martin and that is for in-person classes what will the protocol be if a student in one of the in-person classes tests positive? How will the quarantine process work? Thanks. So if a, if a student tests positive, then they'll be immediately um, notified of their positivity and Cheryl Anderson's team will come in and perform contact tracing, which is basically asking the student who they have been in close contact with um, in the previous time period relevant to them. That student that's positive, as Hamlada mentioned, will be received, will um, be moved into isolation housing and provided meals, as well as the student's close contacts will also be be provided quarantine housing. So quarantine um, is two weeks where they are um, uh, they are uh, tested and they're they're monitored for infection as well as ensuring that they are, they don't transmit to other individuals. So if an individual tests positive, for example, in a dorm and um, through our asymptomatic testing program, then we may then go back into those dorms to assess for other infections as well. So um, we have a, a strategy in place in order to both consider the the cases that are identified as well as identifying other potential cases. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So student housing is obviously a huge concern. And the next two questions are for Himlata Javeri from HDH. First to Himlata, how will UCSD support students, both grad and undergrad, in navigating the housing issues in the fall? Thank you, Bob. Um, I would say we know that flexibility is absolutely critical. Uh, we've been very upfront uh, as students have gone through their contracting phase. It is stated on HDH FAQ page that in the event, the public health scenario requires um, us to ask students to vacate their on-campus housing. Uh, students would not be charged for unused portion of the housing and dining. Uh, we instituted that for the spring quarter as well. We were one of the first campuses uh, to institute, institute that and our students greatly appreciated us making that decision early on. And again, we've been extremely transparent with what our process would be uh, for the fall. Thank, thank you, Himlata. And the second question is how, what, what steps are being taken to, to, guarantee, to maintain safety even with double occupancy in the dorms? Thank you. I would say that's a really good question. Uh, we will be asking students that when they do return to campus, uh, again, as we're going through the testing uh, over the 10 days of moving, that they're limiting the interaction to their residential college. We are very fortunate that every residential college has their own dining area, so they're able to limit uh, their movement during the move-in period. Uh, we will also be asking students that they're, with, that they're wearing uh, face masks uh, when uh, they leave their housing area. So if, even if they are in the elevator within their own building, that they're absolutely following uh, safety protocols. Uh, very frequent cleaning of um, high touch areas that students uh, uh, would engage with. Um, our dining would be completely to go for the first 10 days of move in. And again, if the health guidelines require us to go longer, we can do that. We have a very robust online ordering process for our dining. Thank you, Himlata. The next question is for Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel, Cindy Palmer. Cindy, if a professor is at high risk due to age or underlying condition, will they be excused from being on site? Um, thanks, Bob. We don't have an automatic excusal program, but anyone with any underlying medical conditions or who might be at high risk should engage in the interactive process with their department HR or AP staff. Um, this process will determine any and all accommodations that may be needed, which may include um, absence from campus or additional PPE. Um, there's a wide range of programs. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question goes back to EBC Simmons. EBC, can you describe the logistics of how lab classes or small seminar classes will be handled in the fall? Will there be hybrid lab classes? Do we have guidance? Thanks, Bob. Um, we're in the process of developing more detailed guidance and it will um, probably mirror the kind of guidance that's been given in the research lab context for um, class labs. We've already, through the uh, uh, process whereby students enroll for classes, limited the number of students who can enroll in any course or any course section. So the um, ability to maintain social distancing in classes is already built in by having um, the right number of students in any given course room. But more detailed guidance about um, PPE and so forth will be forthcoming. We're working on that. Thank you. Thank you, EBC Simmons. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Vice Chancellor Matthews to uh, return. I think there's some questions that have been coming in that he might want to uh, comment on. You know, I guess one big question is how will we enforce safety protocols? How will we get people to wear their masks? And uh, what, what plans do we have in that area? Uh, great question. I think quite candidly, it's a community effort. All will have to be involved, whether it's uh, a PI in a lab, a faculty member in a classroom, uh, all are gonna have to participate in advising folks that they should be wearing the mask. Uh, if they're repeated, incidents where people refuse, then there will be an, what I'll call an escalation of activity that might include uh, having EHNS or others uh, provide some educational support to the individual. We, we'd like to start with education and, and trying to get people to do what is appropriate. And, and after that, we'll have to see if there's continued and consistent nonconformance. Over the last several months, uh, we have had staff out talking to, to people, students, as well as some non-affiliates walking the campus, trying to convince them to conform, and by and large, people have. But there are some exceptions, and we will have to address that as best we can. I, I don't want it to be an enforcement approach as much as hopefully we educate, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Matthews. Uh, the next question is back to EBC Simmons, and the question is, how will the university ensure that faculty and students have access to appropriate technology resources to support a remote or online, online learning ex experience? Thanks, Bob. So we'll be building off of the systems that we put in place during the spring quarter. For example, um, uh, Student Affairs collaborated with um, information technology to uh, create a laptop loaner and a uh, hotspot loaner for uh, students so that those without the um, uh, existing ability to um, take, uh, connect to remote classes because they didn't have the technology, we lent them what they needed. And that was whether they were here on campus or even for some students who had had to go home to somewhere else, we could mail them uh, what they needed. And so we'll, we'll be continuing to do that sort of thing. Uh, beyond that, of course, the um, uh, Teaching and Learning Commons is partnered with uh, Educational Technology Services, and they continue to work with uh, individuals and entire units on uh, preparing for remote teaching on the one hand and successful remote learning on the other hand. So we'll be continuing and ramping up these, um, these same efforts. Thank you, EVC Simmons. And the next question goes to Vice Chancellor of Research Sandy Brown. Sandy, which applications were, for, for research ramp up, which applications were approved or, reject, or rejected and why? And how many times is a PI allowed to submit an orange phase proposal? Oh boy, this is a really good, good question. Um, most of the applications that were submitted were in fact uh, accepted. It is uh, an important process, however, for the department chairs and for the deans to collectively decide how to be able to uh, ramp research up within their area, prioritizing those projects that actually have to be on site to do them. 
So the way we think about this primarily is to maximize what can be done offsite to try to facilitate that and uh, for the on-site projects uh, to be uh, considered as a collective so that we are not biasing against one type of research or another. Um, uh, and uh, so that's why, as you saw in my initial slide, there were projects that uh, spanned uh, all divisions and all departments of campus. Uh, there is no limit to the number of times that an individual can apply and at researchadmin.edu, uh, we can answer any questions that can help you get your proposal uh, uh, for your research uh, operation into alignment with the requirement uh, for campus. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. Actually, I'd like to follow up with another research related question. And that is, what is the process for a lab worker or graduate student who feels they cannot conform to safety requirements because of pressures from a principal investigator or professor? Oh, this is such an important question. You know, we, we consider research opportunities as uh, really uh, integral to the education that we do. Uh, and it, this will be important as we move to the return to learn process as well. So we already have graduate students and undergrads and postdocs uh, on campus. In fact, 30% of the people who are in the labs today are graduate students. So we're being attentive to the needs of graduate students and we're prioritizing projects that need to be completed for educational reasons. However, if a student, whether it's an undergrad, a graduate student, or even a postdoctoral scholar has concerns and they've shared those concerns with their uh, principal investigator or their lead faculty member or mentor, and they feel as those that, that is not adequately addressed, then we encourage them to go to the uh, appropriate individual in their department or to the Dean of Graduate Studies to have that conversation because it is our policy that no one will be forced, no student will be forced to be on campus. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. Uh, I would like to go back to Vice Chancellor Matthews and there's a question came in, are we going to allow members of the public on campus going forward? Could you repeat the question? Is it related to non-affiliates? Yeah, non-affiliates on campus. At this juncture, I think that there was or is a task group that was part of the return to learn, and they, had, they I believe, address that. I, I'm not sure at this point. I, I think it'd be tough to have a total prohibition, but I also think it's, it's important for us to really look at limiting those activities. I think, for instance, organized activities for non-affiliates should be reduced as much as possible. Um, I guess my greatest concern is the walk-on, the neighbor who wants to walk their dog, uh, but we'll have to address that. And I think we can do some of it. I think some will get through, but there may be ways to uh, communicate that more widely to the community, that we want to keep it to right. a very small number. Right. Well, thank you, Vice Chancellor Matthews. So now there's a question for Himalata, and that is how many students have used the quarantine housing so far over the, this period? Thank you, Bob. We've been very fortunate that we've seen very low positive cases in on-campus housing. So between all of spring and summer so far, I would say less than 10. Okay, thank you. So the next question for Dulce is for Dulce, and it's a, it's a hard one. I, I think it goes beyond just Dulce answering it, but the question is, if the university is forced to go remote and ICE attempts to enforce deportations, how will the university respond? Hi, Bob, thank you for the question. Um, well, the, well, first of all, from my understanding, the decision to go remote will really depend on um, the guidance from the San Diego Public Health uh, Authorities and also the state of California. Uh, and from that guidance, then the university will then make the decision about what they will then do with their operational plans. Um, students who um, are attending a remote only program would then have the, would, would have to make two choices. Number one is transfer to another school or number 
to leave the United States. So the commitment would be to assist our international students with that transfer process if they are able to do so. And number two, to facilitate um, their, their leaving the United States in a timely manner so that way it doesn't result in removal proceedings or jeopardize their future status and ability to return to the United States in the future. So that's what we would be committed to doing is really providing guidance and support for our international students so that they know what they need to do to fulfill and to meet the needs or meet the requirements. So that way they don't fall out of status and therefore then uh, are subject to remo removal, removal proceedings. Thank you, Dulce. And I'd like to ask the EVC if she would like to follow up. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, to add to what Dulce has, also, has already said, um, we are very mindful of, these, of this new uh, uh, rule from uh, ICE, and we would therefore make every effort to maintain the hybrid courses that in-person or hybrid courses that are required for uh, international students residing in the U.S. to maintain status. Um, for example, if a course is hybrid and it's already had a number of in-person meetings, if the last couple had to be remote, it would still be a hybrid course overall. And we would, we would do everything we could to make sure that the students either could keep meeting in person if the course was very small, or to argue that they had met the burden of its being a hybrid course and therefore meeting uh, what, what was required. So we, we will stand by our students, absolutely. Thank you, EBC Simmons. So the next question really is one for, for all of the academic leadership, and uh, that is, are there clear triggers for ending in-person instruction? We can all see the news. We know the pandemic is changing around us, and uh, so this is on many people's uh, minds. Clear triggers for ending instruction. So I guess I'll go back to you, EBC Simmons. I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. I can't tell you now what that would be because even the guidance from uh, state public health as to exactly the list of triggers for something um, like closing bars or, or closing museums shifts over time as the data keeps coming in. So we will be guided at any given moment by the public health rules and information of that moment. And we, we, will, we will do what we are told in that regard. But I can't tell you now what that will be two months from now, because right. none of us know. And, and I guess an important point there is that as of today, we couldn't do in-person instruction under the county public health rules. Already. At this particular moment, that's right. And so right. We, but we will safety first. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Himlata, and that is if a student who lives off campus tests positive, will they be allowed to live, live in on-campus quarantine housing? Thank you, Bob. Um, regardless of if a student lives on or off campus, they work very closely with student health services. Uh, student health services will work with a student uh, majority of the time, the guideline is for them to stay at their off-campus apartment and self-quarantine there. Uh, if student health determines otherwise, um, HDH would work very closely with them. Thank you, Himlata. Uh, the next question is back to the Executive Vice Chancellor. Uh, other universities are closing after Thanksgiving. Is this something that UC San Diego is considering? It's true that a few universities have said that. We've decided that um, for a number of reasons, it's not really time to make a decision about after Thanksgiving. Um, uh, for one thing, on our campus, our students um, are not simply sealed in a bubble for 10 weeks and being here absolutely all of the time. So the difference between Thanksgiving and other parts of the quarter is perhaps a little less um, distinct than it is for some schools that are maybe a very small, very isolated population out in the country, like some liberal arts colleges. Um, but also, we're just going to attend moment by moment to what is the right thing to do for the health and safety. It could turn out that on Halloween, 
we realized we should go remote for the rest of, uh, of the quarter. And it could turn out that it's you know, September 1st. We unfortunately have to decide that. We just don't know. So we don't want to prejudge one particular piece of the quarter because we don't know how it's, we don't yet know how it's going to turn out. We're just going to be flexible and deal with what comes. Thank you, Eva Simmons. The next question is back to our public health expert, Dr. Schooley and Dr. Martin. What if students do not consent to be tested or do not want to test themselves properly since it's a self-test? Uh, are you speaking, I'm not sure what the question refers to symptomatic students uh, or to people in the asymptomatic screening program. I think the asymptomatic screening program. So we're currently working on uh, having this be a uh, kind of an all-in campus priority that has to do with something we need to do to have the campus remain open. Uh, just like wearing masks, just like uh, distancing. If we don't do this collectively, uh, we're gonna find ourselves closed down indefinitely. And so we will start with that. Uh, just as with the situation with um, the uh, um, uh, people not wanting to wear masks on campus, we can. Uh, we may need to escalate things as we go with individual people, and we may need to make some of these things mandatory. Uh, we want everybody to participate because this is a. These are all critical issues in the health and well-being of our campus and our community. Uh, so uh, we will see where we go. We have done quite a bit. Um, by we, I mean, in particular, uh, some of our colleagues uh, in um, faculty members uh, in social sciences um, have done some, uh, Nancy Beacon and colleagues and others have done some really very important polling to understand some of the attitudes around these issues. We're trying to take some of these things into consideration to uh, do better messaging. Uh, we heard people weren't uh, wild about nasal swabs, so we're working on uh, validating uh, salivary testing. We heard people were worried about being deported if they were found to be positive, some of the students, so we're working on messaging that. This is independent, independent of that issue. Some people were concerned about uh, what quarantine meant. They were, it sounded to them scary. So we're, as Himbada said, it's, it's your dream room uh, in, a, in a college setting. You've got your own room, no noisy roommate, and your own bathroom with food delivered. What more could you ask? So there are a lot of things along those lines we've been trying to uh, socialize uh, to have people understand what we're doing. And finally, we're trying to make this very easy. Uh, we went to great lengths to break the paradigm with how this testing is done and not have people have to go over and get a lab slip and wait an hour and a half in line uh, we're going to have these boxes all over the place. It'll be easier than brushing your teeth. So we hope it's something that people will not see as a big intrusion uh, and, and really a civic duty. Yes, yes. And Chip, if I could follow up, uh, will faculty be included in the uh, testing protocol? Yeah, we're on one big microbiome. Uh, you know, the way universities are supposed to operate, we're supposed to operate and interact with each other. And uh, if faculty aren't interacting enough with students to share the microbiome from time to time, we're not a university. So. Uh, uh, I, I want all of us, uh, including staff, uh, this is a way of keeping us safe too. So uh, we're fortunate to be in a place where we can be monitored frequently and, uh, and faculty and, and staff are very much in the, same, uh, in the same protection program. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Schooley. The next question is for uh, <clears throat> Dean Antony and Dean Moore. Can faculty opt to hold classes outdoors? Are there locations being considered for this? So I don't know the answer to that question, except I have heard that it has been raised and I don't see that it, it, there should be an impediment to holding class outdoors, except that of course, if you rely on audiovisual equipment, those are available in our classrooms. We've gone to great lengths to identify classroom space that allows for the sufficient social distancing. Um, but again, we know that transmittal is, is um, less prevalent outside than it is inside. So I, I imagine that if someone wanted to have class outside, there wouldn't be a reason not to. I don't know of any plan yet to identify spaces for that. Bob, we're actually just starting to get into that now that we um, are aware of the uh, need to have additional in-person classes available to accommodate our international students. So we have um, uh, been talking about Look, looking at options for that, uh, because it makes a lot of sense. We've got great weather. There are ways to achieve social distancing um, more easily outside. So uh, it's not gonna help us with lab classes, but yeah, stay tuned. We, we are working on that. EBC Simmons, I'd like to, to follow up with a kind of related question. Uh, 
what steps are in, underway to plan for mitigating risks for faculty in face-to-face -face courses in the fall? What if some faculty are reluctant to take on the face-to-face -face classes? Oh, so I can answer the second part uh, first, which is um, as uh, I and we have said multiple times and consistently, um, nobody will be forced to teach in person if they are not able to or if they are not comfortable to. It is their choice. And if somebody has signed up to teach in person and then it comes to the first, you know, comes toward, hopefully toward the first day of uh, classes and they realize that they just are not comfortable to do that. They just need to talk to their chair. Their chair will, uh, you know, will uh, work with them uh, and the dean if necessary to find appropriate accommodation because people do need to be able to have that choice. Um, so we will absolutely work with people. And as um, I think uh, Vice Chancellor Matthews can, uh, can speak to uh, in terms of mitigating risk in the classroom, there are a couple of different things. One is the, uh, the distancing, um, making sure that we have um, very few people in a given classroom, and especially relative to the usual number of people, um, having everybody continue to wear masks in the classroom uh, controlling how people go in and out of the classroom so that they aren't crowding together, sanitizing the classroom. Um, we're taking, going to be taking all of those precautions to um, uh, promote safety and health for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, EBC Simmons. So we're actually uh, getting close to, uh, to the end. We have many, many questions have come in in the chat, and we will... Uh, uh, as I said before, attend to those. But uh, I think uh, this is essentially all the time we have for today. So I wanted to thank everybody for, for all their questions. Uh, uh, we will attempt to answer them all and post them on that FAQ on returntolearn.ucsd.edu. We all know that this situation is changing dynamically underneath our feet, essentially. And uh, we to continue to work together as a university community to uh, rise to this uh, challenge. So uh, we are going to uh, do our best to, to work together as a community. And so I want to thank you all for joining us here today. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you uh, in person as soon as possible. So thank you. Thank you.